Hello and welcome back to the Better Happy Podcast for managers hosted by myself, Mike Jones. What we're going to talk about today is the five-step framework that I've created, tested and proven that shifts work from feeling like it's a lonely uphill battle and struggle to being something that is an enjoyable and rewarding but still challenging team journey. So I created a five-step framework to make this a reality and the reason why I've created this framework is because I had my own struggles. So I came out of college without really having any directional focus in life. I know I didn't want to go to university, I drank too much at college and I didn't really have a taste for academia. So university wasn't an option for me, I knew I'd just get into more trouble. So, so what I actually did was I joined the, the British military. And if I'm honest, the reason I joined the British military was because I thought it was going to be the easiest thing to get into without having to go through a boring interview process because I used to hate admin. I still do. So uh, I, I joined the military and that is my inspirational signing up to the military service story. It certainly wasn't something that I dreamed of since I was a little boy. And uh, I got in and, and I managed to wrangle my way into the intelligence corps. And I did five years in the army and I learned lots from it and had lots of positive experiences that I would never change and they've shaped who I am today. But the reality is I didn't enjoy the work. And in my last two years, I did two back-to-back -to -back tours of Afghanistan. But I also had a really poor relationship with somebody in a senior position. And that, and that can be really tough in any job, but it can be particularly tough in the military where the hierarchy is... Um, more rigid and more on the and, and it has more power than it does in the civilian world. So I became very unhappy, which actually led to me being depressed. But I didn't really have much self belief or self confidence. So I didn't think I could leave that job because I just kind of accepted in my mind that work was this necessary evil that we have to do in order to provide for ourselves and put food on the table. But because I got so depressed in the end, um, I actually ended up leaving. I, I just thought, you know, I'd rather be poor than in this position. So I look back now and I really actually am quite thankful for that situation because the reality is if it didn't get that uncomfortable, I probably would have stayed in a job that I really didn't like just because it was comfortable. So I came out of the military, I was in my mid-twenties and I'd had the job, I'd had the, the nice wage, I'd had the money and I didn't really know what to do with myself. Everything that society had taught me was going to make me happy um, didn't seem to be the case. So what I did was I got a one-way ticket to Thailand and I didn't come back for two and a half years and I did a lot of soul, search soul searching whilst I was living abroad and one day I was living in Australia actually and I was I was walking through Perth train station which is I mean Perth's a beautiful beautiful city so it was a really warm I remember the sun on my back walking to work uh, in a pair of flip-flops I still had some money coming in from the army so I was I had no no worries no stresses no outgoings no responsibilities so my life was pretty good and I remember thinking to myself uh, on the way to work which was a rooftop bar at the time just something really easy and switched off I remember thinking I still feel unhappy so I didn't like my job before I got rid of that now I've got a stress-free job but I still feel uh, even though I've got everything I could really want I live in a beautiful city I'm surrounded by amazing people I'm getting paid well for doing a very easy job um, I've got no stresses no concerns I remember thinking to myself I still feel like something is missing and I, and I remember having this internal dialogue of is there just something wrong with me am I just a bit miserable am I just never happy no matter how good life can be so I was walking to work and I was walking through train uh, through Perth train station and I look over to my left and what I see in the window of a bookshop over and over again was a book on promotion was the face of the Dalai Lama and the book that was being promoted was The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama and bearing in mind this internal dialogue that I had going on at the time I thought that's pretty apt that's um it's one of those moments in life where you think okay that was meant to happen so I actually hadn't been reading much up to this point I was 25 I hadn't really read many books since school I didn't really read many books in school if I'm honest but um I read a few in the army that were on subjects that were important to us but yeah I kind of got out of the this way of reading so I picked up this book and I went to work but I read that book in in, in one day I just couldn't put it down and I remember reading this book thinking, oh my God, why are we not taught this stuff in, in school? And it teaches us about the human mind and about how we, uh, how we hold on to our own stresses and, and grudges against people and how that only makes us suffer. But it also talks about the whole point in life is to be happy. And the way that we find happiness is through meaning and through 
connection and through purpose. And this book really, really was a, was a transformational uh, piece of literature in my life that helped me shape the philosophy that I have today. But one of the key things that I learned from that book was that we're, we all want to be happy, but that the only way we can be happy is by helping others, essentially, by providing meaningfully, um, by, by finding purpose and meaning in our lives. And this was something that I found really fascinating because although it sounds obvious up until this point, I'd really lived quite a, a hedonistic lifestyle. I'd, I'd, I'd chased women, I'd chased money, I'd chased a career, but anything that was for me um, without any thought about anybody else. And I just thought the more I got, the happier I'd be. But the reality is that's not, that's not the case at all. So what I learned from this book was that, well, if you want to be happy, you've got to be a good person and you've got to contribute to others and you've got to make a positive difference in the world through your own unique strengths and talents. And the way that we do that, of course, is, is through our work. So, so this, for the first time in my life, I went for this kind of epiphany where I no longer saw work as a necessary evil to buy stuff that I thought would make us happy but doesn't. But work is an essential part of our lives that um, provides meaning and purpose and connection to other humans. So your work is vital to your happiness. So this was a huge transformation for me. So um, I started to focus on being a better person. I stopped drinking after this and, and really transformed my life. I changed the beliefs about myself and my head and then my life started to get better. So, so, so that's one of the, the, the key points to take away from this podcast that, that's not actually to do with the topic, but it's that the meaning of life is to be happy and every single one of us has the strengths, the talents and the skills to, to help other people, which means we've all got. It, we've all got the tools within us to be happy. Now, the way we find that in the modern world is through our work. Now, it used to be, this is how life used to look, uh, not, not so long ago, we found our spiritual happiness, that connection to a cause that's larger than ourselves through religion. So it's very popular to be in a religious community. Uh, we connected to others through our local communities. This is before the internet and technology and, and other distractions, even before board games as such. So we used to connect with people in person and then we used to work to pay the bills or take ourselves out of poverty if we were lucky and work was definitely seen as a well it probably wasn't seen as a necessary evil it was seen as a a, a a privilege that only a few people could get so we used to have spiritual needs from religion connection needs through community and then pay through work in the modern world that dynamics changed very much so um, less and less people are religious although many still are but those that aren't religious have been left with a spiritual void. Whether they know it or not, we've all got some spiritual desire within us to connect to something higher than ourselves, to make a difference, to feel meaning and purpose. It's what's enabled the human race to survive, right? By contributing to things bigger than us. If we're all just completely selfish, we wouldn't be where we are today. We also connect with our communities less. So um, we don't go out as much. We don't hang out in the streets. We don't know our, the people in our town as much as we used to. So what that means is that that three-way dynamic that used to be work, uh, that used to be religion, community and work, those two pieces have gone now, the, 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 the religion and the community for many people. So people are looking for those things through work. And the data shows us this, right? The data shows us that people are, um, when they're thinking about their jobs, they're looking at the, the vision of the business, the values of the business. Do they get to learn and develop in that business? Do they get to grow as a person? Is it a nice culture? And this is those spiritual and community needs coming through in the workplace. So I thought I had it cracked, right? I thought to myself, right, okay, it's, it's, it's meaningful work that um, that, that we all crave. That's what makes us happy. So I'm going to go back to the UK and, and, and create my own business that creates meaningful work and it's all going to, it's all going to go perfectly. So I came back to the UK and I started my first business, which was a, I had no clue. I knew nothing about business. I didn't even know how to use spreadsheets. So I came back to the UK and I started my first business and that was a gym, a community fitness gym, because it just ticked so many boxes. It brought people together. We got to improve health, um, and actually it was a great little business. So it went from, I started that up with next to nothing in the bank. So I had about 10 grand in the bank and I'll put all that into this, got it started and, and we doubled it in size every year and it lasted for five years, ended up um, being a six figure business. So just small, small fish in a big ocean, but we also had a team of five and, and, and we did loads of great stuff. So it, it was a fantastic business and a fantastic le learning experience for me. But here's, here's the next thing that came along, right? So I spent the whole first part of that story talking about how I didn't really like work and then I learned that work was important, that we need to do meaningful work. So then I came back to the UK with this epiphany and started my own business and, and the work was meaningful and I absolutely loved it. And I, I, I never remember being in work really thinking, I hate this. Um, I loved it. I, I, re, I used to really enjoy going. But something else happened, right? And this is something that I didn't understand before. But now I was very passionate about my work and I had 
a leadership position within my within my role, which was the business owner and a team, I started to find out about my lack of self-belief in certain areas of my life, my lack of belief in my ability to achieve things, my lack of um, confidence with money and my lack of confidence with conflict with people. Ironically, even though I'd come out of the military, but, but interpersonal conflict's a lot different to physical conflict, right? So what that did was it manifested itself as me working all the time and me starting to feel stressed about work again, which was a really difficult position to be in because before I just didn't really care about work. So I did it, I enjoyed it sometimes, sometimes I didn't care, but I never worked so hard that it stressed me out. I never took my work home with me. I never struggled to switch off. Now I had this business that I own that I cared about and that and I, and I had these responsibilities, I started to feel like it was a stress, like it was a pressure. And what this did was it led to me working too much. And it started off with me working um, two shifts a day. Then it started with me working on Saturdays. Then it shifted to Sundays. And every time I'd work more, I'd tell myself, this is only going to last for a few months while I get these few problems fixed and then we're sorted. But months turn into, or weeks turn into months, and months turn into years. And five years down the line, I was totally burnt out. I got to the point where I was um, really unhappy. I was, I was emotionally exhausted, and I was, I was, I'm sure I was depressed. You know, I didn't get it diagnosed, but I had all the symptoms of depression. I didn't want to wake up in the mornings. I no longer felt motivated. I didn't like myself because I wasn't motivated. Um, I felt tired all the time, and I just had no energy. Which led to me closing the gym down, which which was a shame, but it was an important learning curve. And what I learned from this experience is that it's not just about finding work that you love that's the key to having a happy relationship with work. It's about finding work that you love and then putting the structures and system in place to make sure that you don't let that completely take over your life. And therein lies, I believe, the reason why so many people struggle with work. And the reality is most do. So we've got two camps of people. We've got camp one, which was Mike at the beginning, which was we work because we have to. We don't really care about it. It doesn't fill us with passion or excitement or drive, but it pays us, so we put up with it. I think that's where most people are, unfortunately. They sit in that camp. But then in the second camp, we've got the people that really care about their work, and they work so hard that they can't switch off. They, they take their work home with them. They work too much. Um, uh, they get overwhelmed, they get tired and they get burnt out and they deal with all of these limiting self-beliefs that kind of make them feel miserable every day. So, and the data has shown us that that's really high, that's a really high challenge for managers and leaders. And when I say leaders, I'm talking politicians, I'm talking CEOs of companies, I'm not just talking, um, you know, s s low level leaders such as, you, if, you, if you'd like to put it that way. Anybody in a leadership or management position the, the data shows us that a significant percentage of those um, are struggling with their work. So we've got the people that love their work getting stressed and burnt out. And then we've got the other half of the people, well, more than half, the other group of people that just don't really care about their work. And if you think about it, if these people over here that don't really care about their work are being led by people that are stressed and burnt out and struggling mentally and physically, then it's no wonder that for pretty much everybody, work seems like a necessary evil. So that puts us in a unique position, right? It puts us in this position where we now need meaningful work to make us feel spiritually fulfilled and healthy and happy as individuals. But we've got a situation where for most people, work is not a positive. And I believe this is why we've got so much poor mental health in the UK, so much poor physical health in the UK, and why generally we've got a generally quite a negative attitude in the UK around work and life in general. And if we can fix this problem, then, and we can make work, this place that we spend at least 50% of our waking hours, Monday to Friday, if we can make this a positive for the people that lead the businesses, for the people that manages the, manage the businesses and the people that are in the businesses, if we can do that, then we're solving some serious problems. And it's completely possible. And from working, from making my own mistakes and from working with different businesses, starting off with wellbeing workshops and moving to a more um, all-round solution, working with behavioral psychologists, studying the books of the masters of the people that and, and the businesses that love business and grow and, and it's an enjoyable rewarding journey um, i came up with a five-step method that i've implemented in many teams and businesses that does this it, it, can, it creates this shift from work feeling like it's an uphill lonely struggle that's stressful to work feeling like it's a enjoyable and rewarding team challenge still um still challenge because the challenge is part of the journey that makes it rewarding if it wasn't challenging we'd be bored um, but rewarding enjoyable so 
how do we do this? Well, we do it in five steps. So I'm gonna break the steps down for you. And the beauty of this is it spells out a word. So um, the five steps are HELPS, H-E-L-P-S, the HELPS method. And we've got health, both physical and mental, engagement, which is also known as motivation at work, leadership, performance, and particularly performance without burnout, and then finally strategy. So the leadership and the strategy piece focus more on the business side, but the health engagement and performance piece focus mainly on the individual. So I'm gonna break those components down for you now and show you, talk you through how to implement them into your business and why they're so important. If you wanna find out how you're currently performing against these levels and you're, a, and you're a business owner or a team leader, if you head over to betterhappy.co.uk and scroll down to get the free report, you can take a quick uh, two minute quiz that'll give you a score on each of those components. If you're a manager and you wanna find out how you're performing personally on these, there's a separate link that I'll put in below this show that will take you to the five minute diagnostic score and it tells you, right, maybe you're neglecting health or from the way you've answered your questions, health's great, leadership's great, but you're not spending enough time with your team. So the motivation piece might be low. Uh, so I'll link those in the list below. But let's look at each one. So um, health, both physical and mental. So pe people wanna be healthy, not all, pe all people wanna be healthy, but not all people wanna be fit. So what we need to do is encourage people to do the basics of health. Now, from studying Blue Zone Solutions and Healthy at 100, which is in-depth studies around the world's longest lived healthiest communities, what we know is the things that make these communities healthy isn't having the best gym program, isn't following the Atkins diet or keto or paleo, or whatever it might be. The things that make these people healthy and happy are two components. Number one is the environment in which they live doesn't support them to be unhealthy it supports them to be healthy so they so they don't have the temptations that we have which obviously we can't fix but we can talk about in a moment and then number two is the community that they live in is engaging in behaviors without even thinking about it that support being healthy so it's, it's all about community and environment right so they're in a community that encourages being healthy and they're in an environment that doesn't encourage being unhealthy now the problem with the busy modern world in which we all live isn't that it's hard to be healthy it can be easier to be healthy the problem is, is that it's very easy to be unhealthy so humans are hardwired to eat too much to gorge on sugary and fatty foods to be lazy when we get the opportunity and modern life encourages that so what happens is we struggle with our health and then don't like ourselves which means that we struggle with our mental health so the way that we can address this in the, in the workplace is by influencing those two things, right? You've got an influence over the environment and you've got an influence over the community. So you wanna create a community that focuses on the basics of health. And the way to do this is to run health challenges throughout the year, very simple, very basic. You don't need to do yoga. You don't need to be meditating and smelling incense and, and listening to gongs. Um, it's doing the basics. So doing a, a 10,000 steps a day challenge in, in, and creating a team environment around this. Then starting to nurture a culture that encourages these things. So. Oh, at our business, at um, Stanford and Co, we have walking meetings. We have at least one walking meeting a day because that's an hour, which helps us get almost 10,000 steps in. So basic things like this, healthy lunch challenge, healthy dinner challenge, healthy breakfast challenge, doing one of these challenges once a quarter, talking about it, making it part of your DNA, you're gonna supercharge people's well-being. Is everybody gonna do it? No, but if you make it the norm within your culture, you'll be amazed at how many people do do it. Um, and then the second piece is obviously the environment. Now you can't completely um, change somebody's environment, but what you can do is support an environment that encourages good health. So things like not having vending machines that sell crappy food in the canteen, having posters around that do encourage um, healthy eating, providing healthier food options when you've got challenges on. Um, also encouraging, and we'll go into this in the leadership part, but encouraging your managers and your leaders to make efforts in their health, to make sure that they're spending time having a lunch and eating fruit and vegetables as part of their lunch. Basic things like this, will be transformative when it comes to health. What most businesses try to do is they try to buy apps and provide videos and give education and all of this stuff. And although this looks good on paper because it doesn't take much time and it in theory ticks a lot of boxes, it doesn't affect the community or the, env or the environment piece. So you're just gonna carry on struggling with um, poor wellbeing. The, the two key factors are community and environment. And those are the two that you have the biggest influence over. So you have gotta hack them. Next piece then is the mental health piece. Um, I won't go into that in huge detail on this podcast. That can be a whole separate topic. But when it comes to mental health, one of the biggest things is this. H humans, 
but life is struggle, right? And, and we've got this message in the modern world where we believe that we need to not put pressure on people, on our children, not put pressure on our employees, not put pressure on our colleagues, because they might get stressed. Well, if you try and create an environment where you don't put pressure on people, you're just making them less resilient to stress and stress is a part of life. So one of the best things you can do to encourage good mental health in the workplace is be open about the stresses and share that, share that with your teams and managers and leaders should share their struggles with stress, maybe lacking in self-confidence, being really open about their imposter syndrome, which we all have. If you just create a culture where it's easy to talk about that stuff, it will have a transformative impact on mental health. If you've got leaders and managers that like to pretend that they don't have any poor mental health, that they don't struggle ever and that they don't have any self-doubt, then people won't talk and then you'll have lots of poor mental health. So if you can just make it okay for people to talk about it by um, showing that you suffer with it as yourselves as leaders and managers, you're going to have a better mental health uh, culture than most businesses in the world. The next piece then, engagement. And what do we mean here? We mean motivation. So um, when it comes to the workplace, we need to make sure that people want to work hard for us. If they don't want to work hard for us, they're not going to be happy. But also it's going to mean that we spend loads of time dealing with sickness and absence and lack of productivity. The, the, the ball is in the employee's court today. So if you can't motivate and engage your employees, they can play the game. Um, how do we do this? Well, really, we ask them. OK, so there's four key drivers of engagement um, that were identified by the British government in 2008. And this was employee voice. So making sure that you're listening to employees and letting them affect the strategy. Um, strategic narratives and so making sure that you've got an inspiring vision and mission that people can buy into. Engaging managers, so making sure managers plan time to develop their teams and not just get things done. And then finally, um, values, integrity. So making sure that your company has a set of behavior, behaviors that it prioritizes and that those behaviors are listened to. Get those four things in place and you prioritize engagement you're gonna be doing a better job than most businesses again. So we've got health, we've got engagement. The next piece we've got is leadership. So this leans a little bit on the business side, but what we mean by leadership is, do your managers and leaders lead by example? Okay, do they take time to look after themselves? Do they try and balance work and life or do they prioritize or promote a culture where whoever works the most wins? Do they spend time with their teams? Do they show that they're selfless? Um, and we really like to talk about respect for self, um, respect for others, and respect for results. So you've got to kind of balance those three things. If your leaders aren't leading by example, then you're going to have a crappy culture. You can do all of the stuff in the world to try and help people with their health and their well-being and their engagement, but if the leaders aren't leading with it, it's never going to it's never going to work. Uh, culture is created in the shadow of your leaders. Nine times out of ten. Most of the work when I go to teams or businesses needs to be done with the leadership. And when I own my business, most of the work needed to be done with me. I was working too much, I was stressed, I was um, not working on myself, and that's the culture I was creating within the business. P then, performance without burnout. So this is a really important area to understand if you are in business or leadership or management of any role. Businesses that used to smash it that used to lead were the ones that could output the most especially when we were a factory-based economy and, and most of what we sold was products whichever factory could put out the most product made the most money that couldn't be any further from the truth today we live in a world where you can work the, the volume and speed of work has just has has improved a hundred times so it has sped up a hundred times and what happens is when you've got more choice and opportunity than ever before is you can run the risk of being busy on the wrong stuff. And this is what most teams and businesses do now, right? We're scared of making decisions, we're scared of prioritizing, so we try to do everything and then we get stuck and we don't actually make much progress, but what we do do is stress people out and burn them out. I made these problems in my business as well. What helped me transform away from this was learning a process called Objectives Key Results, as taught by John Doer in the book, Measure What Matters. and what this does is it teaches you the disciplined pursuit of less. It forces you to prioritize a set amount of objectives yearly, and then from that, a set amount of objectives quarterly. It's gotta be less than five. I teach teams and businesses to start with three. This is transformational because what happens without this is we get excited, we get into goal setting mode, and we set SMART goals. The problem is with SMART goals is we set so many of them, we don't achieve anything and we feel overwhelmed by the process itself. 
The reason we do that is because we fear making decisions and we fear saying no to things in case we're gonna get it wrong, so it feels safer to overcommit and just try everything. What happens then is we try and do all of these things and progress doesn't get made and we, everybody's stressed and we don't actually feel like we're getting anywhere. Objectives key results will force you to prioritize a few things, which is incredibly effective and um, um, stress relieving for, for you and for your teams. So that's the process that works. It also involves your teams in the process, which means that it drives employee engagement as well. Completely transformational. So that's what we need to do. Now that will link into some of the mental health stuff as well because you'll find that leaders and probably yourself and your managers struggle to do that because of the challenges that it brings about. Or if we say no to something, we might get it wrong. So then we need to do some training on um, decision making and making peace with making mistakes because sometimes you need to make mistakes to make progress. And then um, the final piece is S, strategy. So this is on the business side, but this is what I find really fascinating about this is it's as applicable to you as an individual and me as it is to a team and as it is to a business, right? So if you imagine that your team or your business is on a journey and your employees and your team members are coming on that journey with you, they're assisting you on that journey, now, and you've got to recruit them and keep them interested in this journey. Now, the way that you can recruit and keep them interested in this journey and involve them in the process is by showing them the end destination and saying, how do you think we should get there? How are you going to get us there? If you don't do that, if you don't have a vision in your business, you have no end goal, you have no destination. And what this does is it leaves the direction of the business to the will of the owner who's kind of got the idea in their head but has never put it down on paper. There's so many negatives with that. And the, and the biggest negative is, number one, it, it, it makes the business boring. It makes work feel like work. Um, and the second biggest negative is that it, it stops you empowering your teams. If you don't have a vision, you can't pass that to the teams. You can't enable your other leaders and your managers and your teams to make decisions because nobody knows where they're going. They're just completely reliant on the person at the top. It's a, it's a lose-lose situation. There's a story that really puts this point across beautifully. And this is that JFK visited NASA uh, at late in the evening for a tour and he found somebody mopping the floor. And he said to the person mopping the floor, why are you mopping the floor this late in the evening? You shouldn't be doing that. And the, and, the, and the person responded to him, I'm not mopping the floor, I'm helping put a man on the moon. And that's the value of having a vision. That's, that turns what would be just a menial task, mopping the floor, into a meaningful task, helping put somebody on the moon. All work that anybody does in a company is happening for a reason, right? We don't just clean the computer screen to clean the computer screen. We clean the computer screen so that somebody can do their work, which is gonna help uh, us feel, feed a child in Africa. Okay, it doesn't even have to be that meaningful, right? Even if your job is an ice cream man, you're helping put smiles on the face of children. So it doesn't matter what you do, every, everything you do has some kind of meaning and purpose, and that meaning and purpose is linked to the strategy. And if you haven't got your strategy, which is your vision and your mission and your yearly objectives, it's really almost impossible to get people involved and engaged and excited about what you and your business or your team are about. So when you get those five things in place, business shifts from feeling like a struggle to being a really enjoyable team challenge. So the five are health, health, uh, physical and mental. Engagement, so motivation at work. Leadership, so making sure your leaders and managers are looking after themselves and leading by example. Performance, making sure that we're focusing on a few of the right things, not focusing on everything. And strategy, making sure we're clear on where we're headed um, and why. If you can get those five things in place, even to just a half decent standard, you will absolutely wipe the floor when it comes to productivity, staff retention, staff attraction, compared to the other players in your industry. We are in a new and unique time where work means more to people than it's ever meant before. And if you can figure out how to capitalize on that and get people bought into the work that you provide, you'll be absolutely amazed at what you can achieve and you'll enjoy the process. So I hope that you found some value in that workshop and that uh, you see the value in the five-step process that I've spent years designing. If you'd like to find out more about it, please do head over to betterhappy.co.uk. If you're finding this podcast useful or you know somebody that you believe would, please do tag and share them uh, in the podcast so that they can find this as well. Remember that work, life and business are better happy. I wanna hear you go